If you, uh, <clears throat> looking at Dr. Silas's handout, uh, remember that the, there was an assignment on reading pages 21 through 23, just on like uh, the summary of his, uh, Dr. Silas's uh, take on uh, liberal interpretation. So if, uh, if you did read that or if you have any questions on that before we go on, now's the time to ask. If you look there for a minute, page 21, uh, we have, actually page 19 was the beginning of that part. The basic of premillennial doctrine, this is in Dr. Celius' handout. Um, the literal method interpretation, figurative language, we'll talk about that a little bit today. Um, then he goes on to spiritual meanings. And uh, ends up on page 22, where we're going to stop basically and not go any further into uh, prophecy. Okay. So, if there's any questions, any comments, thoughts on those ver on those pages, if not, we'll just go on. I think uh, Dr. Sewis sums it up. If you want an you know, idea of uh, you know this matter of literal interpretation, allegorism, uh, and uh, there. But let's go on. If you look at your handout um, for today, you have, um, you see we're studying eschatology, we all know that, right? But uh, three areas we have looked at, literal interpretation. These are like pillars or foundations. I mean, uh, to jump into eschatology, uh, without these, I think, would really confuse the issue. Um, like I, I said before, when when I, uh, by God's grace, Kathy and I were sitting under Dr. Silius there in Mount Pisgah way back then, uh, and he taught this uh, class to us, uh, once I understood literal interpretation and what that meant, um, there was no, no holding me back. I understood that premillennialism and uh, then also dispensationalism was, was the key. So there's a lot of interpretation. We, have, we studied that. Prophecy is our next thing. And then philosophy history is, again, um, looking at uh, covenant theology versus uh, dispensational theology. Now, this, remember we said that uh, people are called premillennialist. Well, there's historic, there's classic, and then there's uh, what we call dispensationalist. And so, uh, we'll, we'll kind of, you see, the philosophy of history is how, uh, it is in a way, a systematic putting it all together. You know, uh, what does covenant theology, uh, it is the basis, really, of how um, Reformed Baptist, Presbyterian, and many others, Catholic Church, uh, interpret prophecy. And then for, for uh, a premillennial dispensationalist, it would be the the systematic thinking of how we um, interpret prophecy also. Now remember, I uh, said that, that um, when it comes to prophecy, you know, the, the Reformed Baptist or covenant theology, you know, I'm picking, just picking on Reformed Baptist, okay? But anybody that holds to covenant theology, okay, they kind of have um, a hands-off approach to, to prophecy. They don't interpret it literally, grammatically, historically. And there's reasons for that. Now, interesting, a couple of the books I've been reading, and even Dr. Celius, uh, the, the covenant theologian has uh, is, is like a is like a negative approach. See, all they're trying to do is undermine premillennialism or literal interpretation. That's their goal. And so you say, well, that's pretty uh, you know hard hard saying there, you know. But they are out to undermine literal interpretation. But the fact is that they don't touch prophecy. Um, when they do, they spiritualize it. Uh, they make no, and we'll see again when we get into covenant, theolog covenant, theology, uh, covenant uh, theology and dispensational theology, we'll see that, for example, um, well, let me ask you, uh, what is one of the major distinctions between a covenant theologian and a dispensationalist, a premillennial, what would be one of the major uh, differences that you could think of? 
not just in a matter of how they interpret scripture, that's fundamental. Kathy? I'm not sure if I understand you correctly, but the thing that stands out to me as a difference is um, the definition of Israel and the church. Right, that's the one I was thinking about. That's one of the bigger ones. See, they'll, they'll, they'll say the church existed back in the Old Testament, and so all the prophecies of uh, Old Testament that, that applied to Israel are now applied to the church. You see, that's a matter of interpretation, you see. I mean, not, see, their premise is, you see, they have a premise, they have a bias. Well, Israel and the church, Israel is done with, national Israel is totally done with, all those prophecies of the Old Testament about land promises and King David and all this other stuff are just either apply it to the church, spiritualize it, or it's just dead end roads. It was just written to fill paper. I'm not being mean, but that's basically their, their, their idea. Anything that can undermine literal interpretation for prophecy, which would undermine premillennialism, that's their goal and what they teach. Now, again, the average uh, covenant theologian or one who, you know, Reformed Baptist, Anglican, Presbyterian, uh, Roman Catholic congregation, all, but, you know, a bunch of different ones today, not just those, even Baptists, a lot of Baptists are going back to a hodgepodge kind of thing uh, of uh, <laughs> new stuff that's coming down the line. But anyways, um, so when we deal with prophecy, and, uh, you know, prophecy for today. Was that, is that what's on the radio? Uh, your, your prophetic word for today. Um, I'm not really, you know, I've never, I don't know, I've never really actually, you know, got into any of the, the, the internet, uh, radio, or TV, you know, big time prophecy uh, teachings or teachers, you know. Um, but, when you think of prophecy, first of all, we have to ask ourselves, um, um, how, how do we define it, okay? What is prophecy? And when you think of that word, sometimes you kind of, you know, uh, what is your first, when you hear the word prophecy, what's your first impression? Think of the foretelling of future events. Okay, foretelling of future events, okay. George? It's the other word from foretelling and thinking of foretelling. Okay, you're getting ahead of me, both of you, but that's okay. But I asked you what 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 you what, what is prophecy, okay? So it is a, a what? A foretelling? Future events. And you said, George? Foretelling. Okay, well we'll look at we'll look at the difference of those two words, okay? So um, anybody else, when you think of prophecy or prophets you see, all, all that goes hand in hand, okay, with, with, you know, and sometimes we, you know, like, um, it is true, you know, often uh, covenant theologians, covenant theologians, or theology uh, Christians will stray, stray away from, for example, the book of Daniel, and the book of Revelation. I mean, even John Calvin said, well, I, I don't understand <laughs> the book of Revelation, so, I mean, you know, and uh, so, uh, but uh, the idea is that the, the, the um, when you hear prophecy, sometimes it, it, it uh, engenders uh, horrible visions of this and that, and then, or, or just the, the abuse of it, right? The abuse of it. Now, when I think of prophecy, now, um, it, it just a, just a quick... Uh, note here. You see, um, premillennial or dispensation and covenant theo theo uh, theology, uh, they both were systematized about the same time. You know, one is Darby and, and the other one is um, search for the C, I can't, Jonathan Cochlea or Cochlea, something like that. But these, these you know, they, they had these thinkings, dispensation, I mean, uh, literal and allegorism all along. We studied that in history. But it wasn't until the 18th century or so when you get to Darby and some others, and, and but see, um, coming to theology and, and dispensation theology are relatively, you know, they started basically the same, meaning in a matter of dispens uh, systematizing them. 
Okay, bringing them forth as like a, 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 a organized uh, presentation of doctrine. <coughs> now, remember we said in the early church, the first 300 years or so, it was uh, Chileanism. The reason is that because they, they took the scriptures literally, meaning that they expected the Lord Jesus to return. They expected a literal resurrection. I mean, they expected it. Okay? Uh, Paul, others expected the Lord Jesus to come back in their lifetime. Okay? Well, uh, that didn't happen, so what happened, it began, uh, we, we studied that in history, and I'm not trying to get into that again, but and basically allegorism came in. Um, and, and through the Dark Ages, through the Roman Catholic Church accepted that. And then you have, have towards the 1800s, um, what we call the rational, uh, the scientific rationalistic age, the Enlightenment, okay? Not only was it uh, liberalism popping their heads up, <laughs> but you see, the idea of science, rationalism, you got textual criticism coming out full strength. All these other things, liberalism, okay? Um, but one, uh, one other thing that came out in that time is, is basically uh, prophecy conferences. Premillennialism was like in Niagara Falls area, and, and there's all kinds of books, and uh, uh, you know, you have um, probably Tozer and others, and you know, Schaefer, and, and you've got these, you know, like for example, uh, C.I. C. I. Schofield. Ah. You know, all these guys are, but see, there, this, this emphasis on uh, prophecies coming up, compared to just accept all millennialism. Now, remember, post-millennialism post was big until World War I and World War II. See, post-millennialism believes that we're going to bring in the kingdoms, have everything set up, we're going to come into the golden age, we're going to, it's, it's another word for what we call reconstructionism what's happening today, that we're going we're to bring in the kingdom. But post-mill post uh, kind of had a death blow because of a, they had a, an optimistic uh, hope in man, in man's goodness and man's evolution. How evolution, okay? Um, but in those times, we, we have, uh, we have uh, 1800s, we have um, prophecy conferences coming up. Now, I believe, for, you know, this is my own observation. Now, I believe in the, for example, in the early uh, church times, the main doctrine was on the personal work of the Lord Jesus, meaning Christology, the Trinity, the Godhead. And if you read any, any uh, confession, any uh, church councils from that time, um, you find that they nailed down the doctrine of Christ. Now, what happened in the Reformation? That's in the 1500s. Let's say 1500s, okay? Let's say, uh, what happened is the five solas, or the, the, the Protestant church broke away, or, uh, uh, you know, Baptist, we, we say Baptists never needed to be reformed. That's true. We weren't in the Catholic church and a Baptist, okay? But um, from the Roman Catholic church, you have the Presbyterian, Anglican, you're coming out the Protestant Reformation, and what did they nail down? George? Um, salvation. Yeah, doctrine of salvation. I mean, um, you look at Calvin, Luther, Melanchthon, Zwingli, Knox, others, other later reformers. Um, they're all five point. I know, but some of the things that you have to look at is, is like, well, you know, Calvin, like, like the uh, Anabaptist writers say, well, the reformers didn't go far enough. <laughs> They, they needed a, another reformation, you see. Remember we said, uh, as we studied Baptist church history, we, we studied uh, uh, the ecclesiology, or the, the doctrine of the church remained the same as the Roman Catholic church. So you have the big Presbyterian church, you have the big Anglican church, you have, uh, have um, that form of, you know, the Church of Scotland, or the Church of uh, England, or, the, you know, and then in the same thing, uh, Presbyterianism. But, but the idea is that the doctrine of the church doesn't change. Okay? And then something else that doesn't change is, is even, the, even though the reformers were basically literalist, meaning that's how they interpret the Bible, like Calvin says, um, you know, the best uh, way to interpret the Bible is let the Bible interpret itself. 
And so they, they were basic literalist, but see, but the, but um, they weren't fighting, it's just like the early church, like, well, why wasn't premillennialism a big issue back in the early church? Well, they had other things to fight. <laughs> I mean, they, their Bibles are being burned, and books are being burned, and, and 300, so it's severe persecution, and then there's this overall uh, massive uh, inundation of false teaching, false preaching, false epistles, false letters, false gospels, and, and, the, and the church was fighting for dear life just to, to in a sense, uh, triumph and come out with the doctrine of Christ. Now, if you read some of that stuff, uh, Christology back then, it, it's fantastic, it's right on. And so I, I can say the same thing with the Reformation. Though uh, they were fighting for dear life, they were coming out with the doctrines of grace, you know, uh, scripture only, uh, Christ only. All the solos, okay? And uh, and so they weren't really bothering, uh, you know, around with, uh, in a sense, eschatology. And so I think also, and so as we come into the 19th century, and I believe God, Holy Spirit, is doing this, okay? Uh, in the 19th century, we, we have this prophecy coming back to the, coming for the first time, really, to the forefront. Because, for, you see, back in the early church, Christology had to be nailed down. In the middle of Reformation, uh, salvation by grace alone, by faith alone, had to be nailed down. And what is being nailed down now? And again, this is my own observation. Why is prophecy so prevalent? Why is premillennial premillennialism? Maybe not so much dispensationalism, but I think they go hand in hand. We'll see that later on. But... Why is there this insurgent? Why is there so much, uh, in a sense, everybody's talking about prophecy? I think God, Holy Spirit, is opening up the scriptures to us. He's not giving you revelation. We're just, under, you know, like for example, um, you know, uh, I have what's called the Incredible Cover Up. It's a book on the so called uh, when the, the rapture, Irving Knights and some others uh, in the 1800s. They were part of the Miller, Millerites. You know the Millerites, right? They're the ones that, that quit their jobs and uh, put on white robes and, and because uh, Miller had set a date. They're part of the Seven Day Adventists. Same kind of group, all that. Okay? Well, um, uh, up, to, up to the 1900s, uh, who, who, who taught about the rapture? Who taught about the translation of the church? It was basically, it's, you know, very few, and, and so any, any you know, like, like I said, the incredible cover-up is, is, uh, is a book against the rapture view. It's, 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 it's supposed to be come in by a woman who was speaking in tongues in that time in that group, and, and it's, it's a write-out heresy. <clears throat> but you see, when you go to First and Second Thessalonians, First Corinthians chapter 15, what happens? Well, I believe we have clarity now. God, Holy Spirit is opening up the scriptures so we can understand um, that we're not going to be like, like, like the Apostle Paul says. Uh, the second coming is not, it's going, to want, it's not going to happen like a thief in the night. night. We're not going to be deceived. We're children of the light. We're children of the day. We're, going to, we're expecting the, uh, what's it, int, int, uh, imminent? Say the word. Imminent? Imminent, Im I mean, I'm trying to work on it. imminent return. You see, that, that has been lost in the church because of allegorism, spiritualizing, okay? Uh, Augustine and uh, City of God and others, okay? And so now the, the prophecy's back in, and, and uh, you know, we're in the last days for sure, we're in the, but see, we're getting even closer. How, you know, how much time do we have before the church will be taken out? We'll see. I think that's God, Holy Spirit, uh, putting the emphasis on prophecy to help us get ready. So, prophecy. Let's give a definition here. Here's the, um, the uh, encyclopedia says this. Uh, Buchanica uh, says, prophecy in religion, a divinely inspired revelation or interpretation. Okay? Prophecy. A divine inspired revelation. That's important. Now, the Hebrew uh, has the idea of bubbling up. <laughs> henceforth, uh, uh, hence, 
pour forth words. Somebody uh, look up, if you would, Exodus 7, 1 through 2. Exodus 7, 1 and 2, and uh, if you would read it. Exodus 7, 1 and 2. Joseph, go ahead. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of his land. And so this is, gives us the idea that it is, it is an authorized person to speak for God, okay? An authorized person to speak for God. Now, again, you can think of all the prophets of the Old Testament, all prophets of the New Testament, prophets of the, of the great, great Tribulation period. Two witnesses, I believe, are prophets. Okay? Uh, let's see. Kathy, why don't you read for us Deuteronomy 29, 29. So we're trying to... Uh, prophecy in religion, a divinely inspired revelation or interpretation. So Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Okay. <coughs> so, is there anything wrong? Is there is there anything wrong with looking up prophecy and trying to figure out prophecy? I would have to say no. But if you went down to uh, what is it the uh, Best Western, is it? Next next month, when they have their psychic fair. It's on again, the psychic fair. Uh, if you went down there and you, um, you know, astrology, palm reading, uh, horoscopes, uh, all kinds of other things, okay? Is, is that okay? Isn't it, isn't it, are they, aren't they seeking wisdom? Aren't they seeking to know? Isn't that really something like prophecy? Aren't you, you know, seeking to know something? So, something God has revealed? Joseph? I say, well, why don't we talk to, go take a look at Saul. <laughs> what, what, was, what was his answer? Uh, yeah, Saul's, uh, King Saul. Uh, there are plenty of verses in Deuteronomy, Leviticus, not only including witch and sorcery, uh, familiar spirits, contacting the dead, astrology, all that stuff it is in a sense, uh, maybe you could say a parallel universe <laughs> to prophecy, parallel thought. But you see, all that is a unlawful way of finding out things. Okay, what, what is going to happen tomorrow? Well, um, I think it was the King Nebuchadnezzar and others, the Syrians, they, you know, they talk about looking at the livers in the scriptures. In some way, how the livers are, or looking at tea bags, or all. And this is supposed to be telling you the future in order to, for you know, uh, what um, what's going to come to pass, and then you would act accordingly. But Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty nine says that things are revealed, and they're for us, so we can obey the law, obey His word. Now, now we've studied out. Uh, extensively already, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Remember we said uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 in our morning messages a while ago, we talked about three words. Well, it was inspiration, revelation, inspiration, and illumination. Okay? And, and remember, just to cap, or just to touch on this, remember, um, the Corinthians, they, they, they were using, you know, it says they were, they, they wanted wisdom. And they were using the world's wisdom, um, and they thought, well, that's where we can get wisdom. And so chapter 2 is, is where Paul, the apostle, begins to say, no, no, you don't need to go to the world for wisdom. God has given us his wisdom. Christ is our wisdom, and, and this is how God has, okay, given us this wisdom. First of all, there's revelation. God is giving us revelation, just like Deuteronomy 29, 29. Revelation is something, how would you define revelation? Anybody? Revelation. How would you define the word revelation? Something that God does that we can't do. It's, it's not 
not anything that we can find out for ourselves. It's something that God has to give to us and show us. Right. So it's a revelation is, is that you can't search it out, you can't find out. God has to communicate it. Okay? For example, um, this is Abby, why don't you look up Genesis 3.15? Genesis 3.15. Would this be the first prophecy? <clears throat> That's the called the proto evangel, the whatever. Uh, it is the first mention of the coming of the Messiah. But notice what it is. it's a prophecy, isn't it? Telling what's going to happen in the future. And but see, the idea is, you know, and notice here. Uh, what happened after that prophecy? Well, um, uh, Eve uh, names her next son Seth, right? Who's Cain and Abel, Seth. And in the, in, the, in the Genesis, I don't know if it's four or five, Genesis gives the idea that she was expecting the Messiah, the Savior. And it, where did that expectation come from? Genesis 3.15. So revelation is something that can that God has to reveal. It cannot be made known other than God revealing it. Okay. Now <coughs> the idea of inspiration we talked about is uh, gifts of inspiration, things of that sort, and we're going to talk more about that. But that's how God communicated. Um, he gave uh, special gifts uh, to to apostles, prophets, okay, uh, writers of the of the uh, Old and New Testament. Where, you know, again, uh, it wasn't that we believe in verbal, plenary inspiration. Every, every word, um, the very words are inspired, and all of it is inspired. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and, and it is proper. So, the word inspiration is special men, women, had, had gifts, okay? And, and, the, and the sense of prophet would be in that group too. And then we come down to illumination. First Corinthians chapter 2 talks about illumination, right? Uh, we don't have, uh, we took, said, well, there, God is not giving out any more revelation. Uh, the gifts of inspiration have ceased, that's what we believe. Okay, so there's no more prophets, no more prophets, uh, apostles. God is not writing the Bible anymore. Okay, he's not giving out more re revelation. And so, so sometimes we say, well, that means we're, um, we're left out. No, no. We have the completed canon. We have the completed scripture. We have the best translation, the King James uh, Bible. And who else do we have? I didn't say what. Who else do we have to help us? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Okay. I mean, the Holy, and that's the, that's the whole, you know, we've, we've gone over chapter 2 a little bit of 1 Corinthians, but that's the real, the whole idea, you know, who, you know, Paul ends in chapter 2 saying, you, you have the mind of Christ. Wow. Okay? Uh, you, you are able to discern. Uh, no man judges you. You have the mind of Christ. The natural man dis, uh, understandeth or uh, cannot discern the things of the Spirit. He's spiritually blind. But... The Spirit of God freely gives us all things. He opens up the Scriptures. He gives us an understanding. Again, dear ones, go back to interpretation. Literal interpretation. You see? How does God, Holy Spirit, communicate to us today? Well, it's through the Bible. Preaching. Teaching of the Word of God. Now, you know, well, what about dreams? Visions? Voices? Well, we'll get to that. You know, it's not like, like well, you know, we would say going down to the uh, psychic fair is wrong, okay? What about going to a Pentecostal church or a charismatic church or something like that, and, and, a, and a guy gets up and says, I have a word from the Lord. I have a word from the Lord. I have a word of wisdom. God is giving me this revelation about what you're going to do in, in the future. Is that true? Hmm. So, Let's see, Joseph, can you look up Luke, 20, uh, Luke 24, 45? And read for us. Luke 24, 45. Then opened he their understanding, 
that they may understand the scriptures. Who said? You see, that, that's what we have today. You see, that was good enough for the apostles. <laughs> I mean, Luke 24 is, you know, <clears throat> talked about how, how the Lord, uh, you know, from Moses all the way, he begins to expound all the things concerning himself. Wow. That would have been a, what a Bible lesson. That would have and then, you see, we, we're, we're, it's implied, God, Holy Spirit has to open their eyes. And so, uh, there, we see, their eyes are open, and then uh, the gospel is presented, and, and their commission, in a sense, is given. Okay? The apostles' commission. That they, that, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to raise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You see that? God's will being interpreted, illuminated, and the apostles obey it. Okay? So this idea of prophecy. In the Greek, prophecy means to speak for or before. Okay? Now, you, you probably know this. If we went, um, let's see, do this one here. Uh, history. And you've probably seen it. History. His story. Okay? Whose story is it about? It was the Lord Jesus' story. Now, there, there are, uh, <clears throat> like Jonathan Edward has a tremendous work called uh, History of Redemption. And it's, it's a classic and it covers, but he's, he's a, he's a, a mill in, in that sense, okay? Or he, he, uh, he allegorizes some things, okay? But the idea that is he, he, but he goes from the beginning to the end of the, he says the church in the Old Testament. But again, but the idea is there's the history of redemption. And so, um, let's see. I, Lizzie, you're not supposed to be holding the baby. You're supposed to be opening your Bible. So we'll go to Leah. Leah, look at Revelation 19.10 if you would. <coughs> Revela Revelation 19.10. So when you think about prophecy, I want you to think about that that it's a vital part of the of the scripture. <coughs> okay, go ahead. Revelation 19:10. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Okay, so what is that saying to us? He said, the testimony of Jesus. Testimony of Jesus. That's, he said, that's what, he said, I'm just a fellow servant. John, I believe he's talking about John. And he says, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And the Lord Jesus is the prophet. And, and in a sense, the word of God made flesh. But everything, not just, you know, you say, well, that's all the Lord Jesus talks about, prophecy. No, no, that's not the idea. The idea, we can go to the Gospels, we can go to the Old Testament, we can go to the Epistles, we can go to the Book of Acts. The idea is everything's written about Him. His story. Now, we mentioned there in uh, Luke 24, I'll read that to you. I mean, I, I put a part of it, but just let me just, you see... When you think about prophecy, you're, you should say, well, this is part of how God the Holy Spirit, how God the Father, God the Son, is going to tell us about the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Prophecy. Well, what kind of prophecy was given for the first coming? Wow, a lot. What about the second coming? A lot. See, who's it pointing to? It's pointing to the Lord Jesus. It's pointing to the Lord Jesus. You see, every, everything's wrapped up in Him. Everything is, is confirmation of the ages is, is in the Lord Jesus when He comes back the second time. And so, so Luke 24, you know, I mentioned it, but uh, I like it. Verse 27, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, He expounded unto them all the, in all the scriptures the things concerning Himself. And then uh, we have a part of uh, verse 44 we read on. It says, These are the words which I speak unto you while I was yet with you. This is Luke 20, um, 24, 44. 
These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And then he opened up their understanding. Notice it. You see, isn't that interesting? You know, for example, can the prophecies of the Old Testament fail? The answer is no, they cannot fail. We'll see that, but see, then we have to get to understanding, well, there are different types of prophecies. Uh, there are uh, near future prophecies, double references. There's uh, what we call uh, uh, foreshortening. That's an interesting concept. We'll talk about that another time. But the idea is that, you see, some prophecies have partial fulfillment, and then they are fulfilled uh, in a more sense, uh, or in a complete sense, okay, like Joel. Joel and Acts, but it also has a future reference. Um, you have uh, in Scripture you have uh, certain certain prophecies from the Old Testament quoted in the New Testament, which is only applications to to that. They're not totally fulfilled yet. And so, but see, the point I'm trying to make is everything points to his story. His story. So the Greek it says to speak for or before. So, we mentioned these things about a prophet. What's, okay, forth telling. What's forth telling? Uh, forth telling. We've got a few minutes more, but just trying to put that up on the board. Forth telling. Okay, forth telling, and then there's uh, maybe there's not a, a four telling. Now, foretelling and foretelling. We're kind of looking at the the office of a prophet. So in your handout, look at that for a minute. You'll see what is prophecy. So you can drop that down, you know, work through that. <coughs> Describe, number two, describe the office of a prophet. Okay? Describe an office of a prophet. Now, we put, we get, we put those two words up, but what, um, what do you, what's your first impression or thought when you, and you would, uh, a prophet? <laughs> you know, could ima just imagine for a minute, living in uh, Elijah's day. Isaiah's day, or Jeremiah, some of the prophets. When you, you know, you know, the, we have this this aura around them. You know, uh, especially Elijah and Elisha. You know, um, uh, but the idea is that they were they were men, okay, flesh and blood. Okay, they weren't perfect. They were sinners, but they were they were called, okay. Like I was reading Amos. You know, Amos was saying, you know. I don't know if it's chapter 9 or 10 or whatever it is, 8 or 9. Uh, you know, the, the one guy, uh, one of the king's men said, you know, go prophesy to Judah, you know. And Amos says, you know, I, I wasn't called, you know, my dad, my father wasn't a prophet. I'm not a son of the prophet. I was out there gathering uh, sycamore uh, fruit, whatever. And I was, and the word of the Lord came to me. Okay, so the, uh, the idea of a prophet is, is kind of... Uh, how about 2 Kings chapter 1 when Elijah's up in, the, in that little mountain part and, and then the, uh, who was it, uh, King Ahab's men, uh, captain comes with 50 men and, and Elijah says, uh, if, I'm a, if I'm a prophet, if I'm a, if I'm a man of God, <laughs> same thing Paul uses in, in Timothy for, for Timothy, thou man of God. He says, thou art a man of God and I said, if I'm a man of God then I'm going to send fire down and burn up the the captain and 50 men, and he did. How many times? Three times or, or two times? Now, the third time, the guy comes trembling, right? You know, he, he, he's beseeching the prophet. Oh, prophet, I know you're a prophet. Please have mercy upon me. The king wants to see you. You see, when I think of a prophet, I say, wow, that's, that's... But the office, okay, and it is an office because God calls you, is foretelling and foretelling. So let's, for, let's just work on this one for a moment, then we'll, we'll end for today. Foretelling. 
to tell forth, right? Now, so, see, we often think of prophets doing nothing but this. Foretell. Predictions. Uh, the word is uh, pronostication. <laughs> predictions. And, um, um, predictions, ap um, ap ap apocalyptic kind of things. Like John the Revelator, stuff like that. Um, so, what does it mean? Uh, foretelling, well, interpret God's will. Okay, so they're gonna they're gonna be using the scriptures. Okay, they're gonna be using the scriptures that they already have in the Old Testament, Pentateuch, five you know five books. They're not gonna be uh, they're gonna be uh, expounding on God's will. Okay, they're going to be in a sense reformers. <coughs> they're gonna be teachers calling uh, the nation of Israel to repentance. And, and of course, there's other prophecies to other nations, you know, Egypt, Syria, all the, you know. But the idea is foretelling is basically a reformer, one who has the, the word of God and, and is exposing sin, calling uh, the nation of Israel to repentance, okay? That, that is basically what I would say, uh, you know, in the old... Uh, Kathy will verify this. But in, in some circles in the South, for example, they would say, well, there, there are no such things as prophets anymore, but there are those that have a, the spirit of prophecy, or they come in the spirit of, of a prophet, like Elijah, <coughs> John the Baptist. Okay? Uh, John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. And so they'll say, well, this man today has a spirit in the sense of ministry of a prophet. He's not a prophet, quote unquote, officially, but see, he's, what is he doing? Well, any pastor will do this. Any evangelist will do this. Any, any head of the household, any dad will do this, right? Because it's, that, that's what he's doing. He's taking the Word of God, he's preaching the Word of God, teaching the Word of God, um, instructing the people, okay, and uh, calling the people to repentance. So it's nothing, it, it, doesn't has, it doesn't have to do with dreams, visions, uh, voices, uh, theophanies, and, you know, Christ appearing. No, it just, for, that, that was the majority of their work. Fourth time. So, work on uh, your handout, okay? Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of explain some more on the fourth telling next time. Like, they used to be called seers. The seer. Where is the seer? When they were looking for the, the donkeys for, in Saul's day, they came <coughs> to the seer. His name was Samuel. He was the seer. And so that's an interesting word. Okay? So let's, uh, any, any, any thoughts, comments? Work on your handout for next week. Uh, the last part, uh, number six, is more like kind of getting you into the direction uh, that we're, we're going to be looking at further, okay? So there's a lot of information there, but, uh, you know, uh, see what you can do. Anything else? Prophecy. Joseph, why don't you pray for us? There's nothing else. Father, Lord, and Heavenly Father, we do praise you for this day. And Lord, we thank you for the Word of God you so wonderfully preserved for us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, how he resides in us, and is able to reveal to us the Holy Scriptures and what they mean. And speak to us, O Lord, to continue to direct us each and every day. O Lord, we thank you as you will illuminate, you open up our eyes. And we praise you for these opportunities where we can come together to gain a bit of insight their perspective, their history, uh, oh Lord, seeing other people's views, looking at the different ways. And we thank you, Lord, that we can take this opportunity. We ask that each one of us to be able to grow, to learn to apply it, to uh, better learn to study your Bibles, but also, Lord, we pray that you would direct us now and be with us, and we would <coughs> be ready for the main service. Oh Lord, as you would prepare our hearts, and Lord, bless the time of singing and of praying, and that it might be all pleasing to you. Yeah, so Jesus name.